Uh, my name is Rick Blakely, and my co-convener is Richard Gordon, and it's our great pleasure and honor as uh, officers of the geomagnetism and paleomagnetism section to introduce our 2010 Bullard lecturer, Andrew Jackson. The Bullard Lecture, as you know, is part of the Bowie Lecture Series of the American Geophysical Union. It's, it's given annually at the fall AGU meeting, and Andy is our ninth recipient of this award. Andy Jackson is a native of Great Britain. He received his PhD at the University of Cambridge. From there, he, he went on to hold a postdoctoral position at Harvard moved back to England, became a research fellow at Oxford University, then held a professorship at the University of Leeds, and then finally in 2006 landed at ETH in Zurich, Switzerland, where he currently heads the Earth and Planetary Magnetism Group within ETH Institute for Geophysics. Broadly speaking, his research interests are in the application of mathematical methods to geoscience problems. And his focus, of course, is geomagnetism, but he has ranged away from that on occasion, including using gravity gradiometry to help with the exploration for hydrocarbon and mineral resources. Andy has received the Gilbert Award of the GP section, the uh, Petrus Peregrinus Medal from the EGU, the Price Medal of the Royal Astronomical Society, and he's an elected fellow of the American Geophysical Union. Now, the, the Bullard Lecture, obviously, is named after Sir Edward Bullard, better known as Teddy Bullard. And Teddy Bullard is known for many advances in geophysics, but perhaps is best known for theoretical studies of the self-exciting geodynamo. And so it's precisely, since this is precisely the topic of Andy's presentation, he is particularly an apt winner of the Bullard Lecture. The title of Andy's presentation is uh, Geomagnetism, Geomagnetic Secular Variation as a Window on the Dynamics of Earth's Core. So without further delay, I would turn the podium over to Andrew Jackson, our 2010 Bullard Lecturer. So thank you very much, uh, Rick, for that kind introduction. Um, we have a picture of uh, Teddy Bullard on the screen working in Africa. And uh, it's a particular honor for me to give this lecture um, for two reasons, really. Uh, uh, first is the admiration that I hold for the work of Bullard, in particular, as, as Rick uh, said, his work in dynamo theory. Um, but secondly, uh, um, uh, there is a, a link in terms of um, academic genealogy. Uh, so uh, um, my supervisor, David Gubbins, was a student of, of Bullard. So uh, I'm very happy to be part of the, the lineage. Um, so before I start out, I, I want to just uh, acknowledge um, many people who I've wor worked with over the years and whose, um, whose joint work will be, will be shown uh, uh, during this presentation. Uh, they're listed down here. Some of these are active, ongoing collaborations. Um, <clears throat> and many of them were either students or postdocs with me, either in Leeds or in, uh, in Zurich. So <clears throat> what I want to do today is to, uh, to tell you about um, several things. I want to start with the very basics and explain to you uh, what we have in terms of constraints on the, um, the dynamics of the core. So I'm going to talk uh, uh, for a little bit about the data which is available to us to help constrain the core. And then, as, as I put in my title, I want to talk about um, geomagnetism as a window into the Earth's core. So <clears throat> I want to look inside the core as much as I can. And I've, I've chosen two topics to talk about. One of them is, is very um, new. It's not, not work of my, myself at all, um, but I think it's very pertinent to the general theme. Um, this is work that just came out this year, and I'm, I'm drawing on the analogy between uh, seismology and geomagnetism, so we'll talk about that. 
And uh, then I want to talk about uh, using the long-term secular variations as a probe using variational data assimilation. And uh, you, we have a, a map of the, uh, or, or a, a, a drawing showing um, a meteorological weather system here. And um, th this is really a, a, a direct um, link between meteorology and geomagnetism. It's, it's relatively new in, in many ways. We're 30 years behind the meteorologists in, um, in using this technique, but I think it's very, very exciting. So in many ways, the things I'm going to talk about are um, work which is already in, in place and um, has been accomplished over the last uh, uh, few, uh, last couple of decades, so that's uh, work from the past. Uh, I'll talk about work from uh, today, really, from, from the present, and then I'll, I'll try and give you a, a feeling for what I think is around the corner, very much around the corner um, in the future. So um, let's first of all de define uh, the secular variation because that came in, in my title. So <clears throat> the secular variation is the long-term variation of the geomagnetic field with, with time scales beyond a few years, which ranges out uh, to... Uh, thousands of years and beyond. So that's, that's really what I'm concerning myself with. And these are the timescales which, which can be used to probe the, the core. And here, as an illustration, is, uh, is some data which comes from the um, observatory just uh, south of Paris in France. Um, this is uh, the rate of change of the east component of the mag magnetic field uh, at chambon la forêt uh, over approximately uh, uh, 100 years or more. And <clears throat> these are actually monthly, uh, monthly values, so there's a, there's a little bit of um, scattering them, but, but this is basically the, the secular variation which I'm talking about, these, these uh, long-term long, long changes in the magnetic field that occur over years, decades, centuries, and even uh, on the thousand-year timescale. Now, um, I, I said that I would talk to you about data because that's very important. And uh, this was an activity that I carried out with a collaborator um, over a number of years, Art Yonkers. He's presently at the uh, University of Munster. And uh, uh, we published uh, the, the work in a couple of uh, papers, one of which is in Reviews of Geophysics, uh, 2003. Art went on to write a, a very fine book um, uh, Johns Hopkins Press here, Earth's Magnetism in the Age of Sail, which really gives you the nitty-gritty uh, of everything, and uh, it's available at all good booksellers. So, <clears throat> exactly uh, what are, how, how do the activities of a gentleman like this um, affect us in our studies of the um, Earth's magnetic field? Well, it's, it's probably known to many of you that um, direct observations of the magnetic field have been made uh, probably for a thousand years starting in China and then uh, probably for the last 500 years or so in, in, um, in, in, the, in Europe. And this is an example of someone taking a land measurement of, um, of declination. Um, he's, uh, he's, using a, he's citing the, the sun and he has a compass here and he's making a declination observation. So let's, let's first of all define uh, the, the quantities that we can measure to characterize the magnetic field. And we, here we have, of course, the magnetic field is a vector quantity, so here we have uh, the different, different quantities we, we might use. Let's say this is the actual field. Um, it's, it has a strength, which is the length of this vector, uh, so that's the intensity. It also has an inclination with respect to the horizontal. And <clears throat> if this is uh, true north, the, that the projection of that vector onto the horizontal defines magnetic north and the angle between true north and magnetic north is the declination. And that's the quantity that's been measured uh, over um, hundreds of years with a, with a compass. So <clears throat> um, with Art and, and a few other collaborators, um, we put together a, a data set of... The, of uh, it, it's by far not a complete data set. Believe me, there is, is plenty more, more data out there, but, um, uh, well, it's what, what we uh, managed to do a, a, over about a, a period of um, eight years or so. It covers the 16th and 19th centuries. Um, at, 
present there's about 187,000 data in there. We're just actually updating this data set with data from the uh, 19th centuries, which will you know, put us over a quarter of a million data. Uh, there are 2,000 voyages. Uh, there are quite a lot of inclinations in the data set, which is, which is important. And even prior to 1700, you have quite a nice uh, amount of data. Um, I should say that this, this, uh, this whole activity of, of uh, collecting um, uh, historical data, the significance really was, was uh, recognized by David Gubbins and Jeremy Bloxham, uh, um, starting in Cambridge in the, in the uh, mid-80s. So let's have a look at the, the kinds of uh, data that are available to us in this activity. So starting prior to 1590, um, the declina declinations you have in both hemisp hemispheres, uh, uh, the North and South Hemisphere, but they're uh, largely in the Atlantic Hemisphere, a little bit of data on the West Coast of um, America. But very rapidly, the amount of data grows, and already uh, um, in the uh, 17th century, you have Pacific voyages here. So you're starting to have a global uh, data set. And uh, as we go on in time, you can imagine the uh, data coverage becomes increasingly um, good. And so in the, um, eight, uh, the, the uh, excuse me, in the 18th and the 19th centuries, uh, it's very good global coverage. Now, you, you can't just use it declinations, so you need inclinations. And here is the 18th century, and you'll see that there's already very good coverage with inclinations over the, uh, the globe. There are actually some inclinations prior to this. I haven't, I haven't plotted them. And similarly, very nice global coverage here. Of course, intensity was really only put, measured and put on an absolute scale from about 1832 on by Gauss. But um, even prior to that, there were measurements of relative intensity. So uh, the, uh, use, looking at the oscillations of a needle, um, be, uh, uh, looking at the relative uh, rate of oscillation between two places. So there actually are some um, inclinations even prior to that. Um, and this, is, again, is the 19th century. Very nice uh, coverage. So, so that's the, uh, the kind of data set that we put together that uh, can be used for constraining the, uh, th the dynamics of the core. I want to just briefly touch on one other type of data set, which I think is going to become increasingly important to us, um, and that is uh, uh, data for the Holocene magnetic field, which have been uh, put together, um, well, by a number of people, but uh, I think largely uh, led by uh, um, the Scripps uh, uh, collaboration, Kathy Constable and Steve London. Um, this is taken from D Donadini, I've lost the, lost the laser already. Um, Fabio Donadini put this together. So it's, it's rather interesting that uh, even over the last 10,000 years, you have a significant amount of uh, uh, data. This is from archaeomagnetic uh, artifacts. This is sedimentary cores. Quite a nice uh, continuous uh, distribution in, in time, although it, um, it has to be said that the uh, the sites at which these, these uh, measurements are made are, are a little bit more uh, scattered, but it's certainly even, um, in, even quite nicely global in, in, in their coverage. So I think that will become uh, increasingly important in, in the future in, um, in what I want to tell you about right at, right at the end, the, the ongoing activity. So there's the summary. Over, uh, uh, over the last 300 years, we have excellent global coverage. High, high temporal resolution. I have not given you a feeling for how accurate these measurements are, but believe me, they are very accurate. We've, we've tried to assess the accuracy of these measurements. We believe the intrinsic accuracy of, of many of these measurements is around about half a degree in declination. And um, I would like to suggest to you that it's, it, it would be actually hard for you all to go out and make a measurement um, of that accuracy. I'm sure you could, you could achieve it, but it's not... Uh, uh, it's not to be sniffed at. Uh, that's a very good accuracy. Over the last uh, 12,000 years, uh, let's, let's just characterize it as, as, as there are nice temporal constraints uh, existing on the field at sites which are scattered all over the globe. Um, um. So our interest is, of course, in the core of the Earth. And we make measurements um, here at the surface of the Earth. 
And in the core, of course, we have a, a magnetic field. The, the magnetic field is generated. In the core, um, the outer core is, of course, um, molten iron with some, an admixture of, of lighter elements. Um, the, the core is convecting, so there is a, a fluid flow in the core, and of course that convection is, is important in the generation of the field itself. And we make the measurements here on the uh, top of the Earth's crust, which itself is, uh, is, uh, is magnetized, and therefore it, it, it adds a source of noise to our measurements, which we have to uh, take into account. Um, but the tools for, uh, for, for, for um, analyzing the field and for, for creating a, a map of the field here at the core surface uh, are in place. They have been known how to, we've, we've known how to do this for probably 20 years now. And one of the key things that we do in this activity is to actually just simply approximate the uh, mantle as an insulator. It is an approximation. We know that there is, there is finite mantle conductivity, but if we, if we work over rather long timescales of several years, the effect of that conductivity um, is not, not significant. So we can, we can simply uh, uh, adopt a, an insulating mantle assumption. Now, those of you in the room who... Uh, don't work in geomagnetism might, might uh, ask yourself um, how the field at the, at the Earth's surface is related to the field at the core surface. And indeed, you might, you might ask yourself uh, what's the difference in the, uh, the field strength there. So I've put together this, this movie just to show you that. So I'm using a uniform contour scale in this movie. So this is the radial field at the Earth's surface. Um, <clears throat> and then we're going to look at how the field varies as we go through the mantle, assuming the mantle is a, a, an insulator, and we get to the core surface. And um, uh, by using that uniform scale, you can see that actually the, uh, the intensity of the field grows significantly. Also, the, the, um, the wavelength of the structures in the field changes. We have much more small-scale field uh, uh, at the core surface. So uh, let, let's say this is a, a, a mathematical projection which, uh, which we uh, understand reasonably well. And um, here's the first, uh, first number that you might wish to think about. Um, essentially, the relation between the, the field strength here and the field strength at the core surface is that, that uh, in, a, in an RMS sense, a root mean squared sense, the field is about 10 times uh, stronger here than it is at the Earth's surface. So um, at the Earth's surface, the field is, is, is of the order of point, uh, point zero 0.03 milliteslas, let's say. And at the core surface, the field is about 0.3 milliteslas. So we have, that's the first factor of 10 that you might wish to, uh, to remember. Now let me just uh, show you quickly um, what came out of this, um, both the data collection activity and then also the, the, uh, 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 the activity of making maps of the field at the core mantle boundary. So this is, uh, this is a movie that runs for 400 years which shows you um, <clears throat> the morphology of the field at the core surface. And you'll see, uh, as you already have seen, there, that the field tends to be clumped into some uh, intense patches. And um, back in 1590, it's really, really di very difficult to, to resolve the field very accurately. So, so the resolution here is, is, is limited. Uh, but, but you'll see that very, very quickly in time, we, we do get the right resolution because the qual quality of the data increases very rapidly. Um, and then we can resolve the field quite nicely. So I'll just play this movie for you. Um, so the, the red shows the intensity of field lines going into the core. The blue shows the intensity of field lines coming out of the core. And there are a number of features that, uh, that we think are significant in this, uh, in this movie. Um, uh, here we are in 1985, um, which uh, is a slightly surprising exactly why we've stopped in 1985. But, um, you'll see that the, the field is, is clumped together here in these four four patches, and what is very significant, and what was, uh, what's been recognized uh, uh, in, in the past, is that the, um, there is a great symmetry here between the, the field in the north and, and south southern hemisphere. So this patch up here is essentially opposite this patch down here, and the same for, for this one, okay? 
And we believe that that is a, a, a very significant um, fact. We believe that is uh, related to the rapid rotation of the core and the fact that Coriolis forces play a very, plays a, play a very significant role tending to align the convection in the direction of the rotation axis. And indeed, you see exactly this feature in three-dimensional numerical models of the, uh, of the dynamo, so the th three-dimensional uh, integrations of the underlying equations, um, making self-consistent um, uh, self models of, of magnetic field generation show exactly that feature. Now, Let's, let, let's just have a look at this again. There are, I, I'm not going to dwell on this actually, but there are other features in the field which uh, I think it's fair to say are not completely understood. Uh, for example, you will see from here onwards, you'll see that there are, there's a significant drift of features here to the west, and indeed that, that kind of westward drift was something that Bullard recognized as being uh, significant. Although there are plenty of candidates as to exactly why that westward drift occurs, I, I think it's fair to say that, that, that we don't completely understand exactly what is driving this, this kind of westward drift. Okay, so that's, uh, that's really the, 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 the state of play, taking, taking magnetic data from the surface, uh, mapping it to the core surface and looking at its evolution. Now, I said that I want to use magnetic data as a window into the core, and uh, I will try to do that and uh, the next thing uh, um, that I want to tell you about is some recent work, which is not, not at all by, by myself, but I'm, I'm rather intrigued by it, and it does fit into the whole, um, the whole theme of the lecture. So um, <clears throat> this actually is a, an illustration from a 3D simulation of the field, a very famous one from uh, Gary Glatzmeier and Paul Roberts. And once you move, here, this is the core mantle boundary. Uh, these are the field lines that we're able to detect which thread through the mantle. Once you move inside the core, of course, uh, it becomes a tremendous mess. And it would be, would be very nice to try to, to understand exactly what is going on inside the core, um, even though we can only make uh, measurements here essentially at, at the core surface. So <clears throat> the, uh, we, need, we need a few... Uh, few salient facts here to begin with. The, um, the, the magnetic field uh, uh, can, be re can be broken into two components, the, uh, the poloidal magnetic field and the toroidal magnetic field. Uh, poloidal magnetic fields are visible at the Earth's surface, so they thread through the core and we can actually detect them. Toroidal magnetic fields are not, they live entirely within the core and uh, um, it's, it's very hard to know exactly what the uh, toroidal field strength is inside the core, even though it's, it's going to be very important. So first order questions are, what is the strength of the magnetic field in the interior of the core? Uh, what's its division into toroidal and poloidal components? And uh, how are the fluid motions organized? So I want, to, I want to now give you a couple of examples of how we might go about looking inside the core. And uh, the first one I label seismology geodesy of the core, if you will. It sounds a little strange. Um, but it's, in a way, it's, it's drawing on the tools of low-frequency si low seismology to, uh, to understand, the, in fact, how, how strong the magnetic field is in, inside the core. Now, <clears throat> it's been recognized for about 10 years uh, since the work of Abaca del Rio, that uh, when you look at the uh, spectrum of um, uh, changes in the rotation rate of the Earth, which, in other words, the spectrum of length of day uh, fluctuations, um, there are, there are, there's a whole host of timescales, many of which are, are linked to the atmosphere. But there, are, there, there is, in this spectrum, so this is a spectrum in, uh, over periods from years, 20 years to two years, in the spectrum there is a bump here in the length of day at a period of around uh, seven years. And uh, that, that, uh, that's always been a question exactly why that bump appears. It, it, it is certainly not uh, related to atmospheric angular momentum um, because when you actually look at the spectrum of ang atmospheric angular momentum, which is this line here, you actually find that there's no peak there. In fact, there's a, a small trough. So this peak here um, was until recently uh, unexplained. Um, there have been some theories about what, what it could be related to, and indeed, uh, Mound and Buffett uh, 
were, one of, were the first, I think, to uh, identify that it could be related to a normal mode of the core involving the, um, the inner core, an oscillation of the inner core. Well, <clears throat> there, is a, there is a mode of, of um, motion in the outer core, which has is, is been termed torsional oscillations uh, ever since uh, really Bruginsky uh, um, was the first to characterize that. And um, so I, I, I call these normal modes. They are, they're a class of, of motions which um, are, are really unaffected by the, um, the rotation of the Earth. And they're, they're, they're like a set of nested cylinders which are able to rotate independently of one, one another. And uh, they are actually, uh, each of the cylinders are, are, are linked. They, they're, they're governed by a wave equation, but there is a link between the cylinders. And the link between the cylinders is the following. This is a diagram that uh, Ma Matthew Dunbury produced, which I think is very nice. We're looking down the rotation axis, and these would be a couple of the cylinders. And as soon as the two cylinders uh, rotate with respect to one another, uh, as is shown here, this is U phi, that would be an azimuthal motion of one of the cylinders with, re with respect to the other. You, you will sh take this, this um, magnetic field and you will shear it, as, as we have drawn here in the red, um, and then shearing that magnetic field creates a Lorentz force which, which, which wants to bring the, the cylinders back together. Uh, so so um, the, basically the, the, the magnetic field acts as if it's an elastic string. You, you move the cylinders with respect to one another. You, um, you create a te tension in the elastic string which wishes to restore the cylinders back to their equilibrium position. And so you can actually generate a, a nice kind of oscillatory motion between cylinders. Now, um, many people, myself included, have uh, looked at this problem and, and um, <clears throat> many of us believed that the, the, the fundamental mode of oscillation lived probably out in, in the um, region of about uh, 50 years, let's shall we say 50 or 60 years. Um, there was some recent work which came out um, this year by the group from Grenoble, um, Nicolas Gillet and colleagues, which... Uh, made the following quite remarkable uh, observation. They, they analyzed the geomagnetic secular variation in the, in the time window of, of approximately, I think, five to, uh, five to eight years, and looked at, um, looked at uh, and then they inferred the fluid motion that was creating the, the geomagnetic secular variation. And this is a diagram um, uh, showing fluid motions as a function of time and as a function of cylindrical radius. So here is the, here is the, um, here is the rotation axis, okay? This is the equator. Uh, this position here corresponds to the tangent cylinder. It's the imaginary cylinder which just fits over the inner core. So it's at about, um, I think it's about 21 degrees away from the rotation axis. So <clears throat> what we have here is, uh, is their results which shows that there are, um, uh, essentially there are um, features propagating from uh, essentially from the, this tangent cylinder here out towards the equator. And um, those, those, um, those motions carry uh, angular momentum because they are, they are cylindrical motions. And you can figure out exactly how much angular momentum they, ca they carry and you can figure out how much, uh, how much they change the length of the day. And on the top panel here is the result of, of Gillet's analysis, um, uh, which shows uh, um, the, 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 essentially the six-year period, six-year frequency in the length of day. So this is the, in the green from the lunar data. This is the green length of day measured um, geodetically. And then in the red is the result from the, um, the prediction from geomagnetism, which tells you exactly how much you should uh, change the length of day. And I think you'll agree that the agreement is quite remarkable. What's particularly remarkable is that we can actually see these waves propagating, or, or these features propagating from the, from the inner core radius out to the equator. Now, um, so I've said these motions account for the six-year peak in the length of day spectrum, but one can do more. One can actually fit, use the, the, um, the speed at which these features propagate to figure out how, how strong the magnetic field is in the core. And these are the results um, of Gillet et al. 
Um, what we have plotted is the root mean square strength of the magnetic field. This is now inside the core as a function of cylindrical radius. So here we have the um, tangent cylinder that's just um, close to the inner core boundary. And here we have the, um, the equator. And you'll see that the root mean square strength of B is of the order of, let's say, two to three milliteslas. It's actually, it tends to be a lower bound. It's actually hard to tell exactly how strong things are here. But the lower bound is maybe two to three milliteslas. Now, if you remember, I told you the field strength of the magnetic field at the core, core mantle boundary. We think that's of the order of uh, 0.3 milliteslas. So there you have now the next factor of 10. Uh, in field strength. The interior field would, would seem to be a, approximately 10 times stronger than the field is here at the, at the core surface. So this, uh, this is, uh, for me, is very, very interesting. In fact, there is a direct link with, with numerical uh, diamond, dynamo simulations, uh, uh, many of which do find a, a similar factor of 10 between the, um, the field in the interior and the field at the, at the boundary. So now we have that the field is 100 times stronger in the interior of the core than it is at the Earth's surface. So that's one very, very special way of making an inference about the core. The, you, can't, you, can't, um, uh, you can't exactly do this in any other way because you're choosing a very special set of, of motions. You're essentially choosing an eigenmode of the, of the core. So it's a one-shot procedure. Um, so I want to talk now uh, about ongoing work, which, is, uh, which probably holds the, the, uh, the potential, I hope, for another type of estimate of the, of the field strength within the core. So this is uh, ongoing work. It's a collaboration between uh, uh, Phil Livermore, who's in the audience uh, somewhere over there, and uh, my student, Quan Lee. Um, uh, Quan is a very smart guy and has done much of the, um, much of the <coughs> calculation that, that I'm going to show you um, today. So the idea is to use the natural long time scale evolution of the, of the core within a, a framework for variational data assimilation to try to find a dynamical state um, for the interior of the core, which, which uh, evolves in concert with the observations. And I'll try and put a bit more flesh on that for you. Um, <clears throat> first of all, we just need to discuss exactly how the, um, the magnetic field evolves in the, in the core. And the first thing we need for that is the magnetic induction equation here, which says that the rate of change of magnetic field with time is, comes about from a combination of two uh, ingredients. The first ingredient is uh, advection or induction of the field by a flow U acting on an existing magnetic field B here. So this is really um, uh, Faraday's law, which says that you uh, induce currents by having a motion in an existing magnetic field. And then we have a second term here, which is diffusion, which is the decay of the field due to the fact that the conductivity of the core is finite. So the fact that we have a finitely conducting ion in the core means that the field uh, gradually heats up, uh, just as, as, as running a current through your copper wire in your house heats up the copper wire, the same effect is, is occurring here. Now, the, the timescales that we think are appropriate for, to these processes are the following. If you look at the, uh, if you use that rate of, of um, westward motion in the core that I've shown you on the animation uh, as, as a proxy for the speed of flow in the core, you come to imagine that the advection timescale is about something like 60 years. Whereas <clears throat> if you take a, a mineral physics estimate of uh, the uh, electrical conductivity of the core, you will conclude that the time scale for diffusion to occur on is something like 30,000 years. So you have quite a strong uh, separation in those time scales. And the measure of the relative importance of those two time scales is, is usually uh, termed the magnetic Reynolds number, R sub m, and that's the ratio of the rate of field creation by this induction term to the rate of decay by the heating term. And uh, when you, when you um, look at these different numbers, you find that Rm is actually rather large for the core. Now, what I didn't say there was that this is a, this is a, a, 
an evolution problem. So the magnetic field evolves in time um, according to this equation. So if you give it an initial state, you, you are then, um, you then essentially figure, you're, you, you're, going to, you're going to define exactly how the system is going to evolve. Um, in fact, this morning I was just at the Bjerknes lecture where uh, they were talking about the work of Bjerknes in, uh, in, in meteorology and he, he indeed had, had the feeling that, that uh, initial state is, is exactly what you need to define a trajectory of, of an equation like this uh, through time. And that's, that's uh, exactly correct. So what we have now is, uh, is a, a diagram here which I've taken from the work of uh, Alexandre Fournier which nicely exhibits um, <clears throat> what we're trying to achieve in, in this uh, activity, which is, is called um, uh, data assimilation. And I, I actually should, at this point, I should say that there, there are a few people in the, in the community that should be really credited for making the link uh, between, um, let's say, meteorology, oceanography, and what could be done in geomagnetism. And, and those include, uh, I think, Weja Quang and Alex Tangborn in, in, at NASA and also Alex Fournier and the group in, in Grenoble who made a very, very nice connection between what could be done in geomagnetism and what is already done in meteorology. So um, we have this, we have this uh, trajectory of, of the magnetic field in time and we have a set of uh, sporadic observations and that, the initial state of the magnetic field here defines exactly how the field is going to evolve through time. Now you, you will wish to have, choose an initial state so that the trajectory is one which agrees with your observations. This example here is one where I think you would agree it doesn't really uh, agree very well. So you might wish to try and change that initial state, that initial condition, and then you have a new trajectory and it might be the case that in fact that agrees nicely with your observations. So the key aim here in this in variational data assimilation is to try to find an initial state here such that the trajectory agrees with the observation that, that you have. And uh, I, I think I, I share the view of, of the, the people that I've already mentioned uh, that this is actually a very worthy uh, activity for geo geomagnetism. Now this has been applied before in geoscience. This is an example from uh, the work of Peter Bunger and, and collaborators, where they looked at, they, they were trying to uh, <clears throat> understand how temperature evolved in the mantle, uh, in mantle convection, and the constraints in that case are, are essentially plate motions and the positions of subducted slabs in the past. Um, they did some twin experiments, some, um, some closed loop experiments where they assume an initial condition, they run their equations of mantle convection forward in time, and the, 100 million years later they get this temperature dependence in the mantle and they showed how to um, um, use this thing called the adjoint method which I'll, I'll, I'll just t tell you about very briefly um, to determine what, what the correct model trajectory should be. So they're, they're, they're performing an inverse problem to try to discover the initial state which is the best one which uh, then evolves in time in agreement with the observations. So over here in this twin experiment is the truth. Um, you'll see that you have a, a, a subducting slab here at, at the beginning and you still have that slab but you have a temperature anomaly here. And then they use the adjoint method uh, based on, on a set of surface data. Um, they start with a, a random a guess for exactly what the true state should be, the initial state is, they use the adjoint method and they are able to recover. Now this best guess is, is essentially their, their estimate of the, of the initial state and you'll see that um, this initial state it re is, is reasonably good, in good agreement with the truth and the final state also. So this is a very powerful method which uh, has had a lot of use within uh, meteorology, oceanography, a little bit of use in geophysics. And um, what we want to do is to try to apply it to geomagnetism. Now, I've already shown you the poloidal and toroidal ingredients of the field. <clears throat> and so the key thing here is that we, the only thing that we do is to make measurements of the poloidal field here at the core surface and we would like to um, infer interior properties in, of the field, including those of the toroidal field. 
Now that might seem to be a quite a lofty goal, indeed it is, but I think we can in, in fact um, make some progress and actually, actually do that. And I want to show you exactly how that's going to work. Just before I do, the, the importance of magnet, magnetic induction is the follow, following. If there's no advection, if there's no flow in the core, uh, it's impossible to tell anything about the toroidal field. If you have um, a, a quiescent core and you make measurements of the ploidal field, the only, way, only thing you can do is to figure out um, what the, um, the, you can make inferences about the poloidal field in the core, which is going to decay on its own separately from the toroidal field, and you will never know anything about the toroidal field. But even a little bit of advection is sufficient to determine the toroidal field structure. And I'm going to show you um, a little toy problem that illustrates that. Um, we've already looked at, mentioned the magnetic Reynolds number. In the core, there is certainly advection. Okay, so point two here is satisfied. And the, in fact, the associated induction is rather strong compared to diffusion, which even makes life uh, easier. The stronger the advection, life is, is easier. So, if I may, I want to ask you to temporarily uh, suspend this belief and um, just uh, bear with me a moment and uh, I want to talk about a, a neutron star toy problem which we've looked at. It's a toy problem that's been constructed to illustrate the basic physics. And for a neutron star, people think that the evol evolution of the magnetic field is given by this following equation. Um, the, this, again, there's still ohmic diffusion, but the in inductive effect is now of a rather strange form. It's induction through the Hall effect. If, if you remember from your high school physics, the Hall effect is basically if you put a semiconductor into a magnetic field uh, and apply uh, a current, you're able to generate a voltage in the uh, orthogonal direction. Um, so this is, the, this is what's thought to uh, be relevant to the field generation in a neutron star. Now there are two things worth noting. First of all, <laughs> this is a evolution, evolution problem. Evolution problems are actually rather tricky uh, in the first place because they are necessarily nonlinear. Every new state is built upon the present state. Um, but this is a particularly tricky one because, um, in fact, you ha now have a quadratic nonlinearity in this problem. Um, so it's, it's even more nonlinear than, than normal. <clears throat> I want to stress again the initial condition, the magnetic field at t equals naught, determines the subsequent evolution of the whole system. And I ask again this question can we determine that initial condition and therefore the, the 3D field at all times? Um, based on making measurements on the surface of the, uh, of the core. Now, to, do, to, do, to solve these, uh, these uh, evolution problems, I, I confess that probably uh, three years ago, I wouldn't have had a clue about how one goes about that. And uh, I, 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 well, I don't, don't wish to <laughs> claim I know too much about it now, but it, it, it's this, this adjoint method is actually a fantastically powerful method for solving these kinds of uh, these problems. Well, with the adjoint method, you, your, your forward problem you run based on your current estimate of the initial field, which I call B at time zero. You calculate the residuals. Then there exists, um, uh, uh, you have to derive this, but there exi exists a, a, a particular adjoint equation which you then back propagate in, in time. You, you propagate in reverse time. And that, can, that miraculously gives you the gradient vector. In other words, the, the, um, the change in your misfit to the observations with respect to your initial condition. And you use that gradient vector to update your estimate of B and you go again. And uh, I've been quite amazed how, how well this adjoint method uh, works. So I'm going to show you the, the results of uh, our closed loop um, proof of concept. The observations of the radial field are taken every 100 years for about 30,000 years, which is one magnetic decay time. I have no constraints at all on the toroidal field. In fact, that's what I would like to try to figure out in my problem. And in our simulation, we've taken the magnetic Re Reynolds number to be rather small, um, RM is 5. So advection is weak. So I'm making life a little bit hard for myself, but I do need some advection, as you know, to, to make this, this possible. 
Now let's uh, just turn back to, to Bullard. Bullard, of course, uh, um, in his 1953 paper with, with Gelman, um, uh, really a classic, he, he presented lots of things, but one of the things that he used in his work on dynamos was this uh, division of the magnetic field into lots of different um, modes or vector spherical harmonics, and this is taken from his paper. These are some uh, toroidal field modes. They, they form a complete description of any magnetic field. Uh, that's the key thing, C complete orthogonal description. And of course, we use this in our, in our work um, in the, on this inverse problem. And so I'm just going to show you this. Um, this, this is the result of, of Quinley's uh, work on this, uh, this adjoint problem. It's a closed loop. We start with a known true state. We have a number of different harmonics here in the same parlance as Bullard. Okay, um, this, we, we just take a known, uh, a, a, a given initial state. This is each of these harmonics is a function of radius. And down here we have a misfit criterion, chi-squared, which tells, tells you how well you're doing, how well your evolving state agrees with um, the truth. And the idea is to try to make chi-squared as small as possible. So let's just ha have a look at how this, this works. Um, this is the, this is, um, okay, you'll see that, that gradually the green curve, which is your, your best estimate as a function of time gradually uh, agrees with the red curve, which is the truth. We've, um, we've, we've got RM is 5, the magnetic Reynolds number is 5. I've taken 7,000 years of data here, and I've actually cheated because I've pretended that not only do I know the poloidal field at the core surface, but I also know it uh, right through the core. Okay, But I don't know anything about the troidal field, and what I'm what I'm able to do is to recreate the true toroidal field from this um, adjoint equation. Now, you might not be very happy with me taking, uh, well, let's just play this because this is fun. This is a, a rendering of the um, isosurface of um, the um, uh, mo modulus of B equal to one isosurface. The true initial state is here on the left, and this is our reconstructed initial state on the right based on 7,000 years of poloidal observations throughout the volume, okay? And to get this isosurface correct, you need to get both the poloidal and the toroidal field correct. Otherwise, you won't, you won't get it right. So this just convinces you that, in fact, you can get the true initial state based on this methodology. Um, okay, but you may not be satisfied with that because I'm, I have cheated there. Okay, so let's not cheat. I'm now going to only take volume, I'm now going to only take surface observations from the surface of the core. I have to take a little bit longer, okay? I've taken 30,000 years of surface poloidal observations. Um, and I now try, try to um, reconstruct the, uh, the interior field. Again, this is the uh, B equals one isosurface. Uh, it takes a little bit longer to, to solve this problem. Uh, we haven't worked terribly on, on, on efficient use of the gradients to, uh, to reconstruct this. But you can see that if you take 30,000 years of, of surface poloidal observations, one, one decay time, you're able to reconstruct this isosurface really rather nicely. Okay. So you may wish to ask, well, what time span of data is required to perform this task? Again, this is a toy problem, so I don't want to, uh, I don't want to insist too much on, on uh, any conclusions here. But um, <clears throat> certainly the case that as the magnetic Reynolds number increases, the time window that you re are, is required for determination of the interior field decreases because advection is working in your favor. Um, so when you have very weak advection, low RM, you essentially need observations over about a diffusive time scale. That's why I took uh, about 30,000 years to be able to recreate the field um, properly in the interior. But at high RM, everything's working in your favor, and um, I would estimate that when R if RM is, a, is a, of the order of a few hundred, as it is in the core, then you probably need uh, ad observations over just a few advective time scales, which is more like 100 to 300 years, or in other words, the, uh, essentially the, the, the time of the historical um, measurements. 
Now, the Earth is not a neutron star, as I think you all agree. Um, the toy problem was, was just um, designed to capture the con complexity. We took a specific term for the induction, and we managed to, uh, to show how you can actually uh, solve that. Uh, using known theories is nothing that, that uh, we've invented, although actually I think it is the first example of, um, of, of using the adjoint method to invert the induction equation. Now, all you need for the Earth to go back to the real, real problem is a relationship between the, U, the flow U and the magnetic field B. And uh, it, it's, well, it's very clear that comes from the Navier-Stokes equation. I haven't talked at all about the Navier-Stokes equation uh, in this presentation, but it's very clear how this all works. And in, I, I think I'm, I'm happy to say there are no, there are no clear obstacles in, in exactly how you now treat this in the adjoint method to... Um, to put that into the induction equation to be able to solve this equation, uh, solve this problem in, the, in an Earth-like regime. Um, final remark, because my time is just, just over, um, I think it's actually going to be very important and very interesting to see how the, these two, these varying types of constraints play against one another, because you have, uh, you have a long, long period of sparse archaeomagnetic observations, and then you have a dense period of historical observations. And <clears throat> you, both of these are important, I think, because it's, it is always the case that this model trajectory needs to evolve in time to be able to meet the high spatial resolution of the historical data, and indeed over here is uh, satellite data as well with even higher resolution. So um, I think that, that both types of data have, have equal, Im equal importance in, in this activity, and I think it's going to be very interesting to see how this all plays out in the, in the next few years. Um, uh, yeah, see what we can, uh, what we can derive um, based on both types of data. So my, uh, my final slide is a summary. I think there are two techniques presenting themselves for determination of interior field strength, which uh, optimally take, make use of the of the nice uh, geomagnetic data sets we have at our disposal. The first is, is, is really making use of a kind of seismic um, technique to, you, to look at torsional oscillations. And it's the wave speed that provides the field strength estimate. The, uh, the, the second complementary approach, I think, is, 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 is rather new. It's still, it's still rather in its uh, infancy, but uh, it's, it, it's uh, associated with looking at the natural dynamical evolution of, of, of on time scales over a few decades. Uh, the advection and diffusion um, com is important. The advection is important for being able to look at the interior field, coupled with the dynamics, which are uh, determined by the Coriolis and Orion's forces. And um, although I have not shown you exactly how to do that, the theory is in hand to carry out the, this latter activity. So. I look forward to uh, what, what we'll be able to tell you about the interior field strength in the future. Thanks for your attention. Uh, before we go on to questions, uh, I want to go th to the formal part of this presentation, and that's to present Andy with the a large lecture certificate suitable for framing. We don't provide the frame, but the certificate. <laughs> Thank you very much. So are there any questions for Andy? John. I the problems of unstable in the presence of noise. Yes, would you use the mic, please? Most adjunct pro problems are unstable in the presence of noise, and you haven't discussed that at all here in this. Uh... I don't think, I'm not sure if. I, I, it's sort I, of like, the, it, it, just for an example, the, uh, the, the, the uh, extrapolation down to the core is an unstable problem that you fix by, by smoothing but, uh, and filtering. Okay, but extrapolation to this core surface is not a really a problem that requires use of the adjoint method. No, but I anyway, we know indeed from, from work, including work of yourself, John, that, that we know how to stabilize uh, uh, inverse problems. I think as a, I, I would characterize most inverse problems as being unstable. And without, without the addition of prior information, uh, then, then they will all be unstable. But in geophysics, I think we know how to, 
to, to stabilize them. I wonder if you're, you're getting at a, a slightly different thing, which is the question of whether or not a dynamical system is, is stable or not. Well, that's what I was going to say. Is there, I mean, there may be chaotic solutions here, in which case the, the, initial, the initial condition may have nothing to do with the final condition, or nothing. Uh, sorry, say again, there may be. The, the, the equation, I'll bet, has chaotic solutions, just like the meteorological one does. That's a, it's, a, I mean, yeah, the, the initial, that, that is a deterministic uh, equation which, which a, a specific known initial condition defines its trajectory exactly. Now whether it has chaos, which means extreme sensitivity to in, initial conditions is a different matter, I think. Oh, it's, it's, but it's absolutely critical to the reality of, your, of what you're trying to do. So, I, okay, well, if, if you wish to suggest I give up, then uh, that might be your... <laughs> Other question? So, so Andy, a general question about the use of data simulation in this context. In, in, in most situations where it's been applied successfully, uh, there's data provided for the assimilation uh, not only on the boundary but also in the interior of the fluid. So uh, here, where we're pretty much restricted to external measurements, is that going to have a big impact on the potential success of this kind of approach? Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right, Peter. It, it makes the problem much, much harder. And I think we know already from, from I can think about the work of, of Wei Jia Quan that, he, that he's, he's shown it's very difficult to recover some properties of the, the interior. But I don't think as yet we know exactly what is and isn't possible. Um, I mean, I, I took lots and lots of very, um, very accurate data in this problem. In the toy problem, I, I mean, I don't have any uniqueness theorem that says that I know that I can indeed recover everything. I simply have a, um, a demonstration that, that with lots of very accurate data, it is actually possible. The question of, of then, it is a limitation just having boundary data, and it's certainly a limitation just having noisy uh, data. And of course, the noise has been amplified by the downward continuation process. But um, it, it remains to be seen. I think we need to have a, have a try at this. Other question? Steve. Yeah, um, a slightly less profound question. Uh, at the beginning of the talk, you challenged us to be able to make a measurement of declination to half a degree. Um, and uh, a, 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 as, as a seafaring man, I ought to know how to make a measurement of declination or inclination from a moving ship. But it occurs to me that I, I don't know how to do that. Oh, OK. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That, that actually was my point. Of course, with the right equipment, we can all make very accurate declination measurements. But with the, A, with the equipment that they had in the, let's say, the, the 19th century, it's, it's tricky. And B, uh, from, from, a, from a moving vessel as a ship, it's, it's extra tricky. But anyway, to answer your question, I mean, how, how do you do it? You, you, you actually need to determine true north. And uh, there are several ways of doing that, but the one which was usually used on board these, these ships was to um, use the, the rising and the setting sun, which, uh, I mean, the bisector of the rising and the setting sun, of course, gives you due south if you're in the northern hemisphere. Um, that's enough to determine the true north, and therefore you, you use your compass direction to, to determine the the declination, you can of course use the, the sun at midday at its highest point. Uh, I've, uh, I've never done this kind of activity. I, it strikes me it's very difficult to exactly tell when something's at its highest point. Uh, the third method would be to use the, uh, the, uh, the stars, use the pole star essentially. Um, but I, I, yeah, so I, I think you make a good point. In, if, if you're on land and you've got the right equipment, you can probably do that. But I think I, I'm full of admiration for the, the, the people who were on a ship and who, who managed to essentially f have half a degree of accuracy in their measurements. Another question? Comment? Hearing none, I would like to thank you one more time.